Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, 2018 Guide to WAN Architecture and Design. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. You're welcome to submit questions at any time using the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. We will go over all questions at the end of the webinar. And of course, there will be a recording of this webcast available within a couple of days. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Jim Metzler, founder of Ashton Metzler & Associates, and Ophira Gossi, Director of Product Marketing at Cato Networks. Dr. Jim Metzler has worked in many positions in the networking industry and is now running a consulting organization. He has written for numerous publications and is a frequent speaker at conferences and seminars. Jim will talk about the state of the WAN and SD-WAN based off his findings from his 2018 Guide to WAN Architecture and Design. Ophira Gossi has over 12 years of network security expertise in systems engineering, product management, and research and development. Ophir will dive into Cato Network's SD-WAN, showing a variety of demos and case studies. Let's get started with our first poll question. Which of the drivers below is the most important to improve your WAN? Increase security, reduce connectivity costs, provide access to public cloud services, prioritize business critical application traffic, or increase availability? You can start answering now. All right, we'll give it just a couple more seconds here. Okay, great, thank you everybody. All right, Jim, please get us started. Bonnie, thank you so much. As this slide says, I have two key topics that I wanna talk about today. One of which is the state of the WAN. And by that, I'm really going to be talking about the traditional WAN, which as we all know is hardware based and very reliant on MPLS. And I'm going to talk about software defined WANs. And as part of this conversation, I'm going to draw on some recent market research which I conducted into the wide area network. In the traditional branch office WAN, which really began to be implemented at the turn of the century, users reside in a branch office. They communicate within that branch over a wired LAN. These branches are connected almost always just to the organization's data centers using an enterprise WAN service typically MPLS. Now there are some key advantages of this type of wide area network. Seeing it's been around for 15 or 18 years, it's well understood and is stable. But there also are some fundamental disadvantages. In particular, this traditional WAN does not effectively support modern use cases. As I'll discuss during my presentation, I'm thinking primarily about cloud computing and mobility. Now, as part of that market research, I asked well over 100 network professionals, what are the factors that are impacting your wide area network? Not surprising, the number one factor was to reduce cost. That makes total sense given how WANs are priced on a recurring monthly basis. But if you take a look at some of the rest of these factors, it's really interesting. Increase availability. That's there because on an ever-increasing basis, IT is business critical. So if the WAN isn't functioning, neither is the business. Provide access to public cloud computing services. That factor was not mentioned as recently as two or three years ago in this kind of market research. But I want to draw your attention to increased security. We've seen over the last few years a tremendous growth in the sophistication, the frequency, and the intensity of security attacks. And increased security is important to network organizations. It's going to be a key part of my presentation. Now, I also want to point out some of the concerns people have with the current WAN services. Now, yes, there is probably a little bit of frame relay left out there. and You can probably find some ATM services someplace. But primarily, network organizations deal with two services, MPLS and the internet. And there are a number of disadvantages 
to each of these services. When I think of the issues with MPLS, I think of factors such as cost and long lead time. When I think of the issues related with the internet, I think of security and performance. So as we go forward with new WAN solutions, we have to be very cognizant of how we overcome those issues on a going forward basis. And I have one more slide as part of this section. So I've just identified the issues with the individual WAN services. And I asked these network organizations, you know, how satisfied are you with your current architecture, this 15-year-old architecture? As this slide shows, two-thirds are at best, at best, moderately satisfied. For me, the bottom line here is that these new requirements, cloud, mobility, et cetera, that aren't being well served by the traditional WAN, that's what's driving interest in new WAN solutions. And in particular, that's what's driving the interest in a software-defined WAN. Now, I asked people, these network organizations, I said, what are your evaluation plans? Where are you in the adoption cycle? And if you look at these first two pieces of the histogram, 49%, call it half, are either currently actively analyzing vendor strategies or the value. There's very aggressive analysis going on now. In fact, if you come down to the third element of the histogram, only 21%, roughly one in five, said we haven't made any analysis. What doesn't show on this chart is nine or 10% have already implemented a software-defined WAN. As you can see here, 16% say they expect to deploy within a year. So taking a step back, what I've got from this research is nine or 10% are doing it today. Half of people, half of organizations are looking very actively at this and a good percentage expect to deploy over the next year. So we're right at the cusp of where software-defined WANs become mainstream. Now, I asked people, gee, if you're so interested, what do you see as the key advantages. And what's fascinating about this slide is these are the advantages people see of a software-defined WAN, and they match up really well with the factors that are driving people to change. So the number one factor driving people to change was to reduce cost. And the number one, or tied for number one, perceived advantage is to reduce OPEX. If you look through this, Improve availability. Availability is one of the issues. So the perceived advantages of software-defined WANs match up very closely with the pain points that people are experiencing with their current wide area networks. Now, I also ask people, it's not sufficient when you're doing market research to always look on the bright side. Gee, you know, what advantages do you see? I also ask, what do you see as the top inhibitors? Now, two of these you have to expect. Uh, the current products or services are unproven or immature. The current technologies are unproven or immature. That shows up on any market research like this about any new technology. The good news here about software-defined WANs is given the massive investment going on in the underlying technologies and products, the issues about immaturity are rapidly going away. But I want to draw your attention to one piece of this graphic. And that's the piece that says it would add complexity. 30% said that. Folks, all of us who run or have run networks understand the challenges of complexity. Complexity kills our ability to be successful. I'll talk more about that later. But we have to keep this in mind, too, as a key thread going to my presentation. How do we minimize or avoid complexity? Because otherwise, it's going to immobilize the network and the network organization. Now, another question I asked was, gee, on a going forward basis, where do you want to host a whole wide range of network functionality. This question is interesting in part because in the traditional WAN, almost all functionality was hosted on site. 
But the emergence of software-defined WANs also brings with it the ability to host functionality in a variety of places. And I was very much taken by the responses here. I mean, one quick observation is the most common response is that people see advantages to having some functionality hosted in the cloud. But if you take a closer look, that dwarfs the response from anything else. It's more than two to one. So it's not just that the majority prefer to see some functionality in the cloud. The vast majority see that. And in my mind, that's kind of the continuation of the evolution that's been going on in information technology. What I mean by that is over the last three, five, six years, organizations have become increasingly comfortable with requiring applications, compute, and storage from the cloud. And we see is that we're at a point where network organizations are becoming very comfortable, in fact, demanding of getting networking functionality from the cloud. Now, another thing, another aspect we all have to consider here on a going forward basis is it's very common with a traditional wide area network to have the network organization implement on a DIY or do it yourself basis, which meant that that organization was responsible for all of the planning, designing, implementing, and managing of the solution. The survey work I did showed that in the current environment, the majority of organizations favor an approach other than DIY. And I also think that that is a result of the growing reliance and acceptance of cloud computing over the last three, five, six years. That organizations in general, and network organizations in particular, are becoming more comfortable relying on third parties for networking functionality. Now, whenever you have a fundamental change in IT, it always opens the door to new vendors. And software-defined WANs clearly are a fundamental change in IT. So I want to draw your attention to, to this slide, which is the result of a question that I asked those networking organizations in terms of their interest in looking for new vendors. By a wide range, they said, Jim, we, we're actively looking for new vendors. 33% said that. And let's just contrast that with only 20% said we're likely to stick with our incumbent vendor. Now, why is that? Well, as I said, the traditional WAN is based on hardware and it's based on a lot of use of MPLS. In that kind of a situation, hardware vendors are unlikely to lead the charge to realize the full potential of software-defined WANs. Vendors are providers of MPLS services are unlikely to lead the charge to help organizations realize the full benefits of a software-defined WAN. And the survey respondents recognized that and said, you know, we're going to go look for new vendors because we want the full benefit of software-defined WAN, not a software-defined WAN that really is hardware-based or uses a lot of MPLS. Now, the initial deployment and the initial discussions of software-defined WAN really focused on providing basic connectivity. The argument was basically, I can lower the cost of your wide area network transmission links. And that's a good thing. I'm not at all implying that's not a good thing. But there's so much more that goes into a wide area network than just connectivity. And so as part of the survey, I said, how interested are you in just basic connectivity versus other higher L4 to L7 level functionality? And if you look at this, if you look towards the bottom of that graphic, that kind of yellow bar, only 9%, less than 1 in 10, said we're focused almost exclusively on providing connectivity. That's not what we're after here. Because again, an effective wide area network is so much more than just basic connectivity. Let's bubble up on this slide to the top bar. 32%, a third. 
Any solution we adopt must offer a broad set of security and optimization functionality. This goes back to the thread that I've tried to um, create through this uh, presentation. Security is critical. It's one of the drivers, again, based on what's been going on in the industry the last three, five, seven years. Raw connectivity is nice, but it's not a WAN solution. It must also come with functionality such as security. But let's now take a step back from what we want to do. Let's take a look at how things have gone. And so I asked my survey base, how has it gone? These initial implementations, the pilots, the initial rollouts, what have been the results? You know, if you look at the bottom four elements of this slide, let's start at the bottom. It didn't increase our flexibility. That was one of the goals, increased flexibility. Only 7% said no. Increased availability was a goal. 9% said that didn't happen. If you look at the bottom four elements here, it says, you know, the goals that we were looking for, we got them. Oh, one, one case in 10, one case in, in uh, five, maybe we didn't get them. But in general, we got the benefits. They're there. That's a very exciting result. But if you take a look at the top elements, implementation was more dif difficult, created security challenges, maintaining policy was more difficult. This is, in my mind, perhaps the most important slide in my deck here. The benefits are there. The people that have gone forward and done this have said, yes, Jim, the benefits are there. But it's just too darn complex. And that's a very important message for this audience today. Now, I want to wrap up my presentation with some key considerations for people out there. You know, the different solutions, there's a wide range of SD-WAN solutions out there, and they come with different cost elements. So it's not going to be possible for you in the audience to compare two or three solutions on a cost element by cost element basis. If the cost elements will be different. What I suggest you look at as a TCO, a total cost of ownership, over a period such as three years, and put all of the cost in that analysis. And yes, obviously that's the cost of any hardware, it has to be there, software, transmission, that's obvious. But if any of your solutions are a DIY or a do-it-yourself solution, one of the traps here is when my clients don't include in the analysis the personnel costs for a DIY solution for all the planning, designing, implementing, and management, that cost is not free. So if you're doing a, a comparison, I suggest you do a three-year TCO, include all of the costs, including the labor costs. I have this phrase here, application delivery, and I'll tell you something that you already know, which is in most cases, a company's business unit managers don't really care that much about wide area networking. What they do care about is the applications they use to run their business unit. So any new WAN solution that we implement has got to be able the effective delivery of those applications. And when I talk about effective application delivery, I mean that the WAN solution has to enable appropriate performance, provide effective security, and can be managed. When I'm talking about management, I'm thinking primarily about doing very rapid and effective troubleshooting. Now, I've mentioned complexity before, in part because the people I work with, the organizations talk about it, and I showed you some of the survey results. My personal take is that high levels of complexity lead to increased cost, reduces availability, creates new attack vectors, and increases the time it takes to add new sites. Now, these are very, very bad things for the network organization and for us as career professionals. Very often, the implementation of a new solution involves complexity, and we saw that was the case with SD-WAN. I suggest you need to choose solutions that have minimum, if any, incremental complexity during implementation, and there's no doubt in my mind that the final state you get to has to have less complexity than you have now. If you continue to add complexity, again, increases cost, reduces availability, there's a whole variety of very, very bad things. Mobile users, again, a lot of the initial discussion of SD-WAN focused on providing connectivity to branch offices. That is a very important problem. 
But it's not the only WAN edge point. And my clients, all of them, have to support large numbers of mobile users. And they have the same need for security, performance, manageability, complexity, as you have with branch offices. So my advice here is don't be so narrowly focused on branch offices that you miss the bigger picture here in terms of mobile users. In cloud computing, I've mentioned that three, five years ago, none of my clients, when they were designing their WAN, gave too much thought to cloud computing. Now it's top of mind. You saw that survey result. People want solutions which both leverage the cloud and provide easy, secure access to the cloud. The ongoing role of MPLS. MPLS has some fundamental challenges, mainly around issues like cost and lead time. Many, if not most, SD-WAN solutions still involve the use of this legacy technology. And that might be appropriate for some people, maybe during the cutover to a new SD-WAN. But I strongly suggest that if you really want to capture all of the advantages of an SD-WAN, you look really hard at solutions that allow you to get rid of the MPLS you have in your network. And security. I'll close on this. We all know the frequency, the intensity, and the impact of cyber attacks continues to increase. And as a result, none of us will be successful going to our boss and say, gee, boss, good news, bad news. Good news, I implemented a new SD-WAN, and boy, we reduced cost. Bad news, we're wide open to cyber attacks. You must focus and make sure that any new solution you put in enables very effective security. So keep all of these in mind and definitely move forward. SD-WANs offer you tremendous benefits today. All right, great. Thank you, Jim. Let's get started with our second poll question. What's the biggest networking challenge you deal with in your current WAN architecture? Last mile quality, like packet loss, stability, or availability. Long haul, middle mile quality, high latency. Connecting sites and users to cloud data centers, like AWS. Speed of site provisioning. Or lack of visibility to network traffic. You can start answering now. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds here. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Ophir? Thank you, Bonnie. And thank you very much, Jim, for your for taking us through the journey of the state of the WAN and the challenges of companies that try to implement SD-WAN solutions um, today. Uh, we I couldn't agree with you more about what you just described, the challenges of deploying SD-WAN and the broader view that required to look on mobility, cloud integration, security, which is an essential part of, of uh, changing the whole architecture of your network. And at the end of the day, and you emphasized it quite well, is the complexity. That when you deploy additional solutions, you don't want to add more complexity. Forget about the cost and everything. If you add more complexity that is too much for you to manage, meaning multiple point solution, complex, uh, complex architecture, and so on, at the end of the day, you'll end up with a uh, complex network that is hard to manage, and probably you're going to suffer from a lot of security incidents and bad performance due to wrong configuration and so on. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I would like to take you to, um, to, to and to talk about Cato's, uh, Cato Network's uh, security solution and global SD-WAN. Um, I think that our solution is quite unique, and I wanted to very quickly describe what you do and then show some case studies and demos of our product. And I'm going to start with describing the architecture that we offer to our customers. Um, the essence of our network starts with the Cato Cloud. Um, it's a fully meshed global network of POPs. And our customers connect their headquarters, data center, and branch locations using tunnels 
to the nearest Kato pop. In the next slide, I'm going to show you our global pop uh, deployment, but I want you to understand what happened and how do you connect your sites to Kato. Basically, if you currently have some kind of a next generation firewall, a UTM, you can just open an IPsec tunnel from your sites to the nearest Kato pop, but we offer even a better alternative by eliminating this firewall and replacing it with a small tunneling device we call a Kato socket, which basically takes all the traffic, encrypts it, and um, run multiple optimization uh, algorithms on the last mile, which I'll go uh, uh, on one of the next slides. But basically, it connects all your branches to the nearest Kato pop and then to our network. The next layer of once you connect to our pop is the network layer. Our pops are connected between each one of them um, using tier one carriers. And the idea is that we are getting over or uh, improving the performance of the internet by having our own backbone, which is tier one SLA backed uh, um, backbone. That means that when we take packet from one side of the world, from one of our pops to the other side, to our next pop, it goes end to end on a single carrier. There is no uh, internet exchanges or unnecessary routes that add latency and increase the pack, uh, uh, packet loss. So we encrypt the traffic at the pop and we take it, we place it on these, those carriers, those tier one carriers, and we take it through our network to the destination. It allows us, and by the way, uh, our Kato socket is our SD1 device. It's our edge SD1 device that improve the last mile connectivity by running multiple uh, uh, optimization algorithm, which I'll describe later. But we are improving the last mile connection that you use. You can choose any last mile connectivity. We'll just connect you to the pop. And from there, we'll take you over our optimized global backbone to the destination. So like branch offices, the headquarters, we also connect cloud data center like Amazon, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and we also connect mobile users. So as Jim described, these are part of the one today. You cannot separate them and think, oh, I'll connect them later and find another solution. They need to be part of your infrastructure, part of the, of the solution that you, that you buy. So we see those resources like any other site. You can, if you have a da cloud data center like uh, AWS, you just, open an IPsec uh, client from our pop to your uh, VPC, or you can implement a virtual version of the socket, and it's part of the network. We just see it as a, as a site, and I'll show a demo of it a bit later. Mobile users are exactly the same. We have a mobile client for all platforms, and they open a VPN connection from the device, wherever they are in the world, to the nearest Kato pop, and they get full access based on the policy. Now, what makes the Kato solution so unique, on top of this very unique architecture, which is scalable and uh, agile, because there is no performance limitation. Our cloud is, uh, can grow very rapidly. We can support any type of customers, starting from one site all the way to hundreds and thousands of sites. Because this is how we design the cloud. We build it and design it from the, from the bottom up to support any type of tunnels, customers, and traffic shape. So what we also did, and which make us very unique, is the fact that we integrated and we built a full security stack already integrated into our cloud network. Each one of our pops run a full security stack, including next generation firewall, secure web gateway. We have URL filtering, application control, anti-malware, IPS. We're doing forensic, um, advanced forensic for traffic. Uh, and everything is built in to your, uh, uh, to, to the Kato cloud. So once you connect your sites, cloud resources and mobile users, everything is uh, uh, protected with the same security policy with one security tool and managed from a single management application. And in, on, it's very general and, you know, it takes time to understand the whole platform and the advantages, but on a nutshell, the use cases that we see for our network our secure cloud-based SD-WAN, which integrate a global backbone, a global presence of point of, 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 uh, point of uh, uh, presence, and security that integrated uh, into the 
uh, to the cloud. So we're actually allowing our customers to A, augment their MPLS network, or B, and it actually relies to what Jim just said, that you need to consider or to find a solution that will allow you to replace your MPLS. In order to re actually reduce cost, you need to think about MPLS replacement. And this is something that because we are not using the internet and our pops are connected over tier one backbone, we actually allow our customers to completely eliminate their MPLS and go with one or two internet links to, uh, that connect their uh, branch offices for high availability. We are offering full security stack in the cloud so you can eliminate your appliances and we integrate into cloud, mobile uh, devices and we have, I'm gonna show you some case studies and you're gonna see we're actually allowing our customers a very fast deployment because the footprint on site is very limited. Basically, you just need to ship a, a socket to any site, you plug it and it's automatically configured and call home to get the policy and that's it. So uh, the whole notion of connecting sites and or increasing or reducing capacity just goes away when you are on board with Kato. Um, this is our global pop map. It actually shows you the, uh, how big is our network. Each one of, our, of those POPs is connected to each other. It's a full mesh. We have POPs, a high density of POPs in North America, in Europe, in Africa, in South America. We have POPs all over Asia Pacific. We have a POPs uh, which is very unique in China that allows uh, global companies to connect their Chinese sites and get reliable connectivity to their data centers, cloud application, and, and so on. We are investing a lot in our cloud. We, we're keeping, uh, we're keeping uh, adding pops on a monthly basis, actually. So it's very unique, and it's, it shows how robust is our network. This is a story, a case study of one of our customers called Fisher. Um, what makes this company unique, this is a global manufacturer. They have sites in US, in China, India, Germany, Mexico, Poland. So they're quite big. And they moved off from a kind of a mixture of MPLS sites to uh, firewall protected sites with VPNing from site to site. So it was kind of a mixture of MPLS, internet VPN, um, secured some sites backhaul traffic in order to get security. Some of them had direct internet access. It was, they had a lot of one optimization solutions on their sites in order for wherever they had MPLS in order to kind of squeeze the most out of their MPLS, their limited MPLS connection. And at the end of the day, they paid something like $27,000 per month just on their MPLS. It was super expensive. It was it limited their ability to grow and uh, to add more sites, to add more capacity. Users uh, complained or on the performance, and, and it was really uh, uh, challenging for them to manage that network. Security again was another issue when you had so many devices in um, in those branches. Someone needs to maintain them to upgrade to patch them, to maintain the policy on each of them. So altogether, they had a complex network and they wanted to increase it, increase capacity, reduce cost, and they did it with Kato. When they moved to us, they eliminated their MPLS. But what's interesting is that when they started, when they talked about SD1, they had MPLS plus internet, kind of a hybrid uh, uh, WAN network. But they realized that with us, because they connect to our POPs and they have they benefit from our global backbone, uh, which gives them kind of an MPLS-like alternative, they reduced their MPLS cost, moving completely to Kato. Um, they eliminated their uh, edge firewalls, so they managed the security with us, and they also eliminated the one optimization devices, and they had more capacity on their WAN. So it's a good example to show how company can actually reduce cost with SD1, which not always the case if you keep your MPLS going and you need your one uh, optimization and you need just adding more technology on top of that. So what actually 
we're saying is that by using the Cato Cloud and the whole platform and this unique architecture, we are allowing our customers using our global backbone, our global SD-WAN, we're allowing our customers to eliminate their MPLS and we eliminate the need for a point SD-WAN solution that just connects sites with multiple tunnels, obviously, over the internet. And in addition, by using our integrated firewall as a service, we eliminate any secure web gateway that you might have in the cloud. We are eliminating the need for firewall and appliances, UTMs on each of those sites and all the burden of and complexity of managing appliances. And we connect, we have a built-in CASB capabilities. We connect to cloud data centers. We have a lot of capabilities in, in regards to protecting SaaS applications. And mobile users is an integrated uh, part of our network. Again, cloud and mobile just looks like another site for us. They just need to connect to the pop and they get A, the connectivity using our global backbone and B, they get the security. And it makes it very unique and we call it the Kato 6-in-1. You can think about multiple point products to build all of that architecture um, and I'm pretty sure that most companies will not be able to create it. Think about the need to create multiple hubs close, cloud hubs close to your multiple location and then integrate security on top of it and mobility and so on. Uh, and Jim said it in the best way that you want to reduce complexity and not just adding more and more to it. So the next uh, case study that I'm showing here is um, it's a big company called uh, Pet Lover Centers. They are based in Singapore. Um, they have around 65 stores uh, in Singapore that sell pet products. Uh, I think they are the biggest in, in, in the area. And they also have fr some franchises in Malaysia and Thailand. And what happened, this is a, a regional SD-WAN um, solution or case study because they basically they started to fear from ransomware attacks on their network. They wanted to add security. Uh, they started off by having routers on each one of their stores. Um, they approached us initially for just for their Singapore stores and they just wanted to place their no security at all, just routers, VPNing to one another. Their point of sales basically needed access to the data center and they started to say, okay, so we need to improve the security and in a few weeks, they actually, they were connecting so fast, they added five locations every week to our network. And at some point they realized that they can, instead of buying MPLS and back all traffic to one of their bigger sites when they have security, they can completely uh, um, avoid MPLS and use our firewall as a service and connect their sites in uh, Malaysia and Thailand to the same POP, the same network. So it's today they have 105 locations. You can see it on the upper right corner this is how it kind of there are, uh, it's a screenshot from our management application that shows the whole uh, organization connected to the Cato Cloud, each one of them to the closest pop. They get both WAN access to their data centers and security in our cloud. So I'm going to show you a demo now of our SD WAN. You can see the architecture. This is the Cato management application. Uh, this site has edge headquarters, branch offices, Amazon Azure. And I'm going to show you our SD1 capability and configuration on one of the branch sites. You can see this is how you configure this, the Kato socket. This specific site has three different transports, MPLS, one fiber, symmetrical fiber, and a broadband. And the internet connections works in active-active. When we go to the uh, uh, policy or that actually shows our network rules and how we prioritize traffic, uh, we're showing very unique capabilities. The first rule that you actually see is prioritizing voice and video over any other traffic because for this uh, uh, company it's very uh, important. As you can see, they, are cho they chose to place it on their MPLS. So it's a WAN traffic, they're using a, a VoIP uh, solution and they're saying, I prefer it to go over the MPLS. Uh, the QoS priority is one. 
So this is a very simple rule, the first one. And the second rule is actually more interesting, showing that this company is using Office 365 and they're gonna, it's an internet traffic. So they're gonna place this on the fiber link that they have. So it's gonna go to the Kato pop and they chose to use optimized access. Optimized access means that the Kato, Kato will take the traffic and drop it as close as possible to their Office 365 data center. I will show another demo about it later. They also enable additional optimization capabilities like TCP proxy and packet duplication. So uh, on the, they have two links, they can duplicate packets on the fiber and, and, uh, and the broadband. The third rule is uh, kind of a sales rule, uh, Salesforce rule. It's again, it's very unique. It's user aware SD-WAN. It actually shows that we can decide that Salesforce, salespeople that use Salesforce will get prior, priority over all other employees that will be dropped into priority four or the, four, the fourth rule. And those users will just use the broadband and will get uh, less priority over the salespeople. It's kind of a glimpse example uh, show of how uh, our capabilities or our SD-WAN. And when we go into the events, you can see here that these are the three transports connected to this specific site, to this branch. Um, you can drill down into the rules and into each one of those links and see the capacity and the latency, packet loss, and so on. Here we can actually see that all or kind of all traffic that was not prioritized get the fewer priority and some packets being dropped because they have a narrow bandwidth on that site because it went into the broadband and it was it got less priority on than uh, Office 65 and sales uh, traffic. So it's kind of a give you an overview of our strong capabilities, uh, which are very unique, I think. A, it allows you to fully control your traffic, connect multiple transport, MPLS, broadband, fiber, 4G, LTE, and so on, and then fully can make sure that your applications perform as you expected. This slide, I'm gonna kind of take you into a deeper dive and show you what we mean when we say that we have a unique architecture and what when we say traffic optimization, I want to talk a bit about it. Um, each of your sites, branch offices, cloud data centers, headquarters, when they connect to the Kato cloud to the nearest pop, we are optimizing their last mile uh, as much as we can. We connect multiple transports um, that can run in active-active. We have full quality of service as I just shown. Policy-based routing, you can choose the uh, optimal um, connection based on application and user. And we run forward error correction to try to reduce errors and packet loss uh, on, on over your last mile. So then when you connect to the POP, we run TCP proxy. So if you think about it, when you connect your sites over with traditional SD-WAN, they do not have their own backbone or POPs or you just VPN over the public internet, when there is an error or packet loss on, on one of the connections, it's gonna take a long time for the host to realize there is, an issue, there is an error in order to retransmit the packet again. Actually, it is gonna be all the way on all the time that it takes the traffic to go all the way to the destination, to the data center. With Kato, since you connect to the nearest pop, we are fixing and correcting errors at the pop and we're keeping our pops as far as 25 milliseconds, up to 25 milliseconds from any uh, one of our customers. So you connect to the pop, we are correcting and optimizing the traffic on the last mile, and then we're shooting it over our backbone, our T two tier one carriers, which we always measure, and we are placing the traffic on the most optimal route. We're making sure the traffic goes in the fastest way to the destination, to the next pop, uh, in order to, to actually to give your our customers an MPLS experience on the long haul. When in regards to data centers, as I said, they connect exactly connect exactly the same to our uh, cloud. And what happened is that because and you've seen that on our global map uh, that I've shown earlier, because we have such a wide deployment. Everywhere there is an Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, 
we have a pop in uh, very high proximity. It means that when you when we take packet from one branch to the other, we're actually dropping it on in front of your data center. So you get an experience of like uh, express route and direct connect just by onboarding with Kato Cloud. So it's very unique in that sense. And obviously on the last mile again, when the traffic goes from the next set, from the next pop to your destination, to the data center. Uh, we run the same last mile optimization. So it's a multi-segment optimization from one side to the other that allows you to use the, the, uh, your connections in the best optimal way and still keeping a very high uh, application performance. This demo, I'm gonna show you an access, optimized access to Office 365. So in this example, we have a, uh, an office, HQ in Chicago, when they chose an Office 65 data center close to them in Chicago. Since it's a global organization and they have branches all over the world in Frankfurt, China, and Singapore, those sites will need to go over the internet, the public internet, in order to access their Office 365 data. Now, the problem with that is obviously latency. I'm gonna show you a demo of how it looks when you connect with Kato and without to, uh, to Office 65. As you can see on the left side, right now only the headquarters in Chicago is connected to the management application. The sites are all the users. These are users in Singapore, China, and Germany. They're not connected. Uh, I'm using the demo uh, Office 65 SharePoint. And basically I just browse to SharePoint and I'm downloading a file. Uh, it's a large file in order to show uh, the, the overall performance. And you can see that performance is not that good, especially you see in China and Singapore, very bad performance. So this is without Kato. Now what we're going to see is that the users from all these sites connect to the Kato cloud. Each one of them connect to the nearest pop to him. And, and you can see it on the left side on the Kato management application, all users are now connected. And the users are gonna download the file again from, the, from SharePoint. You can see the immediate improvement, uh, 44X in Singapore, 20X in, from China, when they access their Office 60, 65 data center in North America. This is an impressive improvement in the overall user experience and the performance they see just by connecting to Kato. This case study uh, is a company called Edroll, another one of our customers. Um, Edroll is a, a US-based company, um, a technology company, and they had an, a very unique problem. They're very heavily invested in the cloud. They have um, a lot of Amazon VPCs, and they have more than 300 mobile users around the world that need to connect to those US-based Amazon data centers. And they have additional branch sites. And the way it worked before Kato was that all of the users and, um, and the branches connected to their San Francisco headquarters firewall. So they had a firewall in San Francisco. Everybody VPN over the internet to that firewall in order to get to Amazon. One of the reasons was security. They wanted to control the user, but the other one, um, was the, the fact that they had multiple VPCs in Amazon and they didn't know how to connect all of them to those mobile users without asking the users to connect, disconnect whenever they wanted different access to a different VPC. So it's really complex before. Uh, they had a single choke point in the network, their connection from their firewall in San Francisco to the, um, to the cloud data center. What they did with Kato actually is installing the Kato client on all the sites, VPNing from the Kato pop to their different VPCs. And by that, first of all, eliminating the choke point in San Francisco. There is no single point of failure right now to their network like they had before. So now the users simply connect single con with a single connection, connect from their device, wherever they are, to the Kato pop and then traffic goes over the Kato backbone and drops them on the right VPC. They don't need to connect, disconnect. There is no choke point. 
they get a better performance, and the users actually told their IT that they can feel the improvement in the actual day-to-day -day work. And so it's very happy customer, and we are um, we actually have a case study and a webinar uh, with them if uh, anyone wants to get more information about it. I want to show you a demo of our product. It shows ex uh, exactly this uh, use case. Um, I'm, I've set up an environment with mobile user that connects to Kato, and we have two different, uh, to make it more complex, we're using one data center in Azure and another one in AWS. So basically, I just set up um, two machines, two virtual machines on Amazon and Azure, and uh, they're just running a web server, a simple web server. And the idea is to show you, so this is the environment, it's a demo environment with, as you can see, four, 14 sites currently connected. And right now I'm gonna start by showing the security policy of allowing access to specific users to uh, Azure and AWS. So I'm adding a rule from uh, saying that any VPN user or specific VPN user I can choose. In this, cho in this case, I just chose a specific user and I'm now adding the destinations, saying um, the first one is uh, AWS in London, and the second one is Azure, um, wherever it is. So it doesn't really matter, I just VPN to those data centers, they're already connected to, to Kato. In addition, I'm adding to this rule that the, the user is gonna, can only use HTTP. And I'll add just uh, on top of it that they connect during the working hours, which is if uh, someone wants to do that. I'm saving the, um, the, the configuration, and basically that's it, okay? The user, uh, the specific user can now access those two resources without having to connect and disconnect his VPN client. Let's make it very simple and efficient. So let's see the user end and the user experience. You can see on the left, the iPhone, the user just opened the Kato application, connects to the Kato cloud, and is part of the network. That's it. You can see that his IP is actually highlighting it to show that he gets a Kato IP address that allows him to do whatever he wants. The user goes to a browser, just go to an um, internal IP address. In this case, he starts by browsing to Amazon, and I got into the web server. And now just replacing the IP, Okay, I don't need to disconnect from the client, I don't need to do anything, and uh, a different web server on Azure. It's kind of an example of the simplicity, what the user experience, basically it's seamless to them, they just need to connect to Kato, and they get access to any resources. They get security, you get, as a customer, full control, or as the IT, full control on your resources and visibility to who uh, does what. So, um, this was a, an overview of the, our capabilities, our SD-WAN capabilities, our cloud backbone, the integrated security, and especially uh, important is the simplicity of everything. So, Bonnie, um, back to you to show uh, uh, the last poll and uh, some, in, some of the questions that are coming in. All right. Ophir and Jim, I just want to thank you guys both for a great presentation. Before we start the Q&A session, I just want to run this quick poll question, and I'm going to leave it up for everybody to answer while I begin. Would you like a free pilot that can get you on board with SD-WAN within 24 hours? You can start submitting now. And let's see, we have a lot of great questions. First question, this is a good one for you, Jim. Why did the first speaker say that traditional WANs can't support accessing the cloud? Bonnie, thanks for that question. Um, I hope I didn't say, I may well have, that a traditional WAN does not allow access to the cloud, because it does. Um, it may sound picky, but what I hopefully said was it doesn't allow effective access to the cloud. And let me explain. In a traditional WAN, what people do is they'll backhaul their internet traffic, first over an MPLS link to their data center, and then hand off to the internet. So you can get to the cloud, that's not a problem. But as opposed to just paying on one link, you're paying on two links, a very expensive MPLS link, and then you know off to the cloud. So you're paying extra, and you have additional delay because you're going over multiple links. 
And as was discussed earlier, once that's handed off to the internet, it could go between multiple ISPs and have all of those issues. So you can get to the cloud using a traditional uh, WAN. You just pay extra and have additional delay. Now that may well be acceptable if the amount of cloud traffic or internet traffic is, you know, single digit, five, six, eight percent. But given where we are now, where it's double digits, in fact, many people feel that for most companies, it's the majority of traffic. That kind of backhauling traffic is just totally unacceptable. All right, great. Thank you, Jim. And Ophira, this is a good one for you. If planning to move away from the traditional hub and spoke WAN architectures, how does an SD-WAN architecture protect the edge? Traditionally, the edge router would be combined router firewall security device. Does that change and how? So I think that um, um, both Jim and myself, we spoke about the, the importance of security. When you change your architecture from backhauling either on MPLS over, or VPN over the internet and having some centralized firewall, now with SD-WAN, you don't want to backhaul anymore. Okay, if you, your users want to go into Office 65 or Salesforce or any business application, you want them to go directly, directly in the fastest path. So you, uh, you need to think different to change the architecture from backhauling and into security in every location. So traditional SD-WAN usually offers some integration with third party firewall solution or security solution, which add, just add complexity to your network. And uh, what we were trying, I was trying to say is that with Kato, basically it's integrated and built into your infrastructure. So you need to, security is important. You need to keep that in mind as the whole architecture changes. All right, before we continue with the rest of the questions, I'm gonna put this last poll up. I'll leave this up as well while we continue, so please feel free to answer. Would you be interested in a free estimate of your networking and security cost reduction using Cato? And next question, this Jim, this is for you. How can my organization implement an SD-WAN given the contractual constraints we currently have with our primary WAN service providers? Well, Bonnie, that's a really important question. And the reason I say that is going back to the survey results, you know, that I presented, I was actually a bit surprised at how many people raised that at, as an issue. And my suggestion here is now I'll, I'll focus on my experience in the U.S. and negotiating primarily with U.S.-based carriers. A lot of my clients typically sign a, a three-year contract, something of that um, magnitude. And they make a promise that they'll spend so many, so many dollars per year. And Bonnie, for the sake of example, let's just say they promise to spend $2 million a year. And for that, they get certain discounts. Well, none of my clients are, are terribly aggressive. They promise to spend $2 million a year. They're probably spending two and a half or three, particularly by year you know, two or three of the contract. And so they've got this kind of surplus, this margin here that they can play with. And let's just, for the sake of example, assume that they're halfway through this three-year contract, so they're a year and a half in. What I suggest that network organizations do is they start a pilot of an SD-WAN. Now, they've got this bubble here, this margin, where they're promised $2 million a year and they're already spending three. So there's no problem reducing their MPLS as part of this pilot and still meeting their contractual requirements. And you know, Bonnie, none of my clients would ever do a flash cut to anything of this magnitude. So assuming that this pilot is successful, then the, my recommendation is that they have a phased rollout, taking out the MPLS over a period of time, and timing that in a way that allows them to meet their contract. And just one more comment on this. Another benefit of this, or the approach I'm suggesting, starting with doing a pilot of an SD-WAN, is let's just say they choose a solution which isn't that good. But just the fact they're trialing a solution puts pressure on their current carriers. So in the good, in the best case, they'll do a, a trial of a solution like Cato's and they'll be very successful and they'll move to it. But you know, in the worst case, if they try a solution which doesn't work, they still put pressure on their carriers, which should result in lowered um, pricing for the next contract. So I really look at doing a trial as just kind of a win-win for network organizations. You should go out and do it today. In some sense, you can't lose from an economic perspective. Okay, great, thank you, Jim. And it looks like we're running out of time, so I'm gonna just get to one last question. 
Um, Ophir, this is a good one for you. What's the difference between Gen 1, Gen 2, SD-WAN, and what comes next? So there isn't real uh, definition to Gen 1, Gen 2. Uh, in general, what we, we can say is that when the first SD-WAN devices came out, they started as um, network low or layer 3 um, devices, and they steered traffic uh, between the alternative transports um, using uh, kind of, uh, it was network-based IP, port numbers, and so on. Uh, later on came the um, uh, application-aware uh, steering, so I'm uh, now more application uh, um, awareness, meaning I can take voice and video traffic on one tra on one channel and steer the others on the on uh, the less quality um, link that I have. Uh, what I suggest is that actually there is a Gen 3 available, and this is what I described that the next generation of SD-WAN has its own backbone. So it doesn't use the, the public internet. So when, when it takes traffic, it uh, can assure some sort of availability and performance over the, over, uh, from one side to the other. Uh, it integrates security, cloud, and mobility. And with everything that we had before, and now we, just, we talked about it quite a lot in this webinar, that SD-WAN is not just branch-to-branch -branch connectivity. It's not just choosing the right path for your application. It has a lot more. It needs to be user-aware. It needs to be able to recognize application on, um, uh, very well and put them on the right uh, channel and or on, the, on the right link, sorry. And it should be able to integrate your cloud resources, your SaaS application, and mobile users into a single uh, secure network. All right, great. Um, for any of you that we weren't able to answer your questions, we will be reaching out. And again, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today. And of course, Jim and Ophir, this is a great presentation. Uh, to our audience, you all will be receiving an email with a link to view this webinar within a couple of days. And we look forward to meeting you again at our next one.